joy of the Lord and won't take it all. Peace of the Lord, he won't take it all. Power of the Lord, he won't take it all. Yeah. Strength of the Lord, he won't take it all. Spirit of the Lord, we won't take it all. And I will hold you forever, Lord, close to me. And I won't let go. I will hold you forever, oh God, and I won't let go. I won't let go of your hand. I won't let go of your hand. I'll never let go of your hand. Never let go of your hand. Never let go of your hand. I'll never let go of your hand. I'll never let go of your hand. I'll never let go of your hand. Never let go of your hand. Never let go of your hand. Good morning. Welcome to chapel. Make your way to your seats. Just want to give a shout out to those who are watching online. Good to have you with us this morning. And I think we've got a couple of visitors from admissions from Byron Center in Farmington. Steven and Julia, are you over here? Glad to have you. Enjoy your chapel. I'm Brian Kono. I'm the chaplain here at Spring Arbor University. Uh, we meet here on Mondays and Wednesdays. Uh, so I hope you enjoy your time here in chapel and then for your, the rest of your visit. We got a, just a bunch of things happen, happening in the next few days, uh, kind of all on top of each other. You will not be bored as we get ready to hit spring break. Tonight from 6 to 8 is the Arbor Renaissance. This is a come-and-go event. It's in the RCF, so come and enjoy this time that we've designed after the kind of the Harlem Renaissance era. 
Um, OIR has put this together for Black History Month. Also tonight in the RCF, right after the, the Arbor Renaissance at 9.30, our spiritual life team has put together a time for, um, this is actually not worship in the Word, it's just a time for prayer. So we have got six different stations that we'll invite you to participate in that will help you go deeper in your intimacy with the Lord and help you focus on, on praying and, and releasing things to the Lord. I'm kind of a, an ADD person, so I need activities to help me focus, and this is a, if you're like me, this will be a great time for you. Also tonight is casting call for short films, which will be happening later in the semester. So that is from 6.30 to 10 in SDH 202. Tomorrow night is movie night featuring Ruby Bridges. This is an event from uh, in RCF, right? Yeah, RCF from 7 to 9, candy and popcorn. And this event is sponsored by OIR and the Epsilon Chi organization. Also tomorrow night is Ganey Oki. Come and show off your talent. Uh, from 8 to 10 in Ganey Hall. And I think there's a couple of people who have the priv privilege of getting pie in their face at some point in this event. Uh, Andrew Phelps and Coach Cam Mills. Is that right? And I think myself. We are all included in that, that list. And then Saturday, the muse uh, trip to Museum of African American History. I think you need to sign up for that, so check the app on how you might do that. It's a free event, leaving here at 9.15 a.m. Uh, trip to Detroit to enjoy the... Uh, the, what the museum has to offer. Okay, check the app for other activities. I'm sure I didn't catch all of them. So on the, on the app under the events page, you can see what else is happening this week. Can you believe it's just a week and a half before spring break? Wow. How many of you are going on spring break missions trips? Good number of you. How many of you athletes are traveling for your sports team? A good number of you, baseball team, golf team, travel and tennis team. Some of you may just be going home. I'm sure you're ready for that break as well. Well, today, shh, today as we uh, prepare our hearts for worship, I just want to give you a, a quick highlight on our speaker. Uh, Rob McKenna is um, from Washington era, area, sorry, <laughs> Washington era, Washington area. Uh, he, has spent some, he has spent some time here in Spring Arbor working with an organization locally. And then last night, he and his partner, Daniel Halleck, spent time doing some training for uh, leadership here on campus over in White Auditorium. Uh, Rob has spent time in, um, with some large organizations in the Seattle area and around the country, um, organizations like Boeing, Microsoft. Maybe you've heard of these companies. Um, he has kind of dedicated his life to business and leadership and understanding the heart of a leader. Um, and in, after spending time working with those organizations, he took that to the classroom and he spent a good part of his career at Seattle Pacific University as chair of their in industry um, organizational psychology department. And he um, helped um, future leaders understand this process of, of business and organizational leadership development and, and how that works in the industry. Um, and after doing that for a number of years, he just, he felt like God was calling him to take that to the streets and to go beyond just business and find ways to invest in leadership, whole life intentional leadership development um, across all kinds of, of disciplines not just business, but um, in, in the area of, of um, ministry and other leadership venues. Uh, so he and his partner, Daniel Halleck, have um, launched leader here in Spring Arbor while his dad, David McKenna, was president of Spring Arbor. Um, you might remember the clock tower is called the uh, McKenna Clarion Tower, and that is named after his dad, who is the president here. His dad, David, actually helped 
Spring Arbor Craft, the concept that you have probably heard a couple of times, that mission statement that we have. Um, and so um, he, he, under that legacy, has really launched in, a, in his own direction in investing in leaders. So I'm excited for him to share with us today. We're going to pray for him and for Daniel and for their ministry at the end of our worship time. So would you now stand with me as we prepare our hearts for worship? Uh, Katie Rankin is going to lead us in our call to worship. Psalm 47, 6 through 8 says, sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth, sing to him a psalm of praise. God reigns over the nations, God is seated on his holy throne. Let's worship God together. So 
is our God. Oh, sing with me how great is our God. And all oh, will see how great, how great is our God.
Pray for them and for their ministry. Pray for our time that we would have open hearts ready to hear what Rob has to share with us. If you'd like to come and lay your hands on them, join us in prayer. We'll lift our voices together. As we pray for this moment for God to speak to us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this song reminds us that your presence is, is here. Your spirit is here in this place. And in moments like this, it's, it's not so much that we invite you to show up, but you invite us to be present with you. And that you, uh, we need to open our hearts to you and what you want to do in our lives. To help us become more aware of what you're doing, to help us to understand who we are better, that we might receive your grace and your love overflowing, that we would speak against the voices in our heads, the voices from around us that would um, speak against the fact that we are your child loved, the one who is loved by God. And so as we um, in this moment, hear from Rob and who is your child and your servant, who is um, a person who's uh, received a call to invest in other people so they wouldn't just be leaders, but that they would be whole leaders. Um, help us as we uh, hear from him and hear from you to be ready to receive, that we would receive from your heart through his heart. And that we would leave this place ready to serve you well. May you be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ready to go, Brian. Straight up. Woo! That doesn't happen every day. Um, do you know it doesn't happen every day? I told uh, Brian, I said, like, is this what you do for all the speakers? And um, I want you to know that's a profound moment for me, so I'm really grateful for that prayer. Um, so I was convicted recently by, an, I've been reading Oswald Chambers. Any of you use Oswald Chambers? My utmost for his highest, you've read it. Um, I'm back into it, and one of the things that has been profound about his, he calls out things that I don't usually think about. And it's, um, there's one one particular, it was in February a few days ago, and he talks about the guy, there's a guy in Mark where Jesus is in the synagogue and the guy with the withered hand. Do you know that story? And um, some of you give me a nod. I need like a verb, like a visual. I've been on Zoom a lot for two years, so like a little bit, okay, all right. So, um, and the guy with the withered hand, he's there in the synagogue, and the, and the story goes that what you remember about it so often, if you remember, is this guy needs healing, and he's, he's got this hand that's messed up, and uh, in the story, it's, Jesus is getting uh, a lot of grief from the Pharisees for healing on the Sabbath. This whole question comes to the table. And so when you read that passage in, in Mark chapter 3, I think it is, I oftentimes think like, uh, that it's about the Pharisees, and it's about the point that Jesus was going to make. But what Oswald Chambers calls out is this. He calls out that it's really about the guy with the withered hand. You hear what I'm saying? Like Jesus is, is about to heal this guy on the Sabbath, which causes a controversy. And it's, it's all about the controversy. We see all that going on. And so we, we lose track of like, did Jesus heal the guy with the withered hand so he could make a point? Please tell me no. <laughs> the guy needed healing. And the guy took initiative to reach his hand out. And I tell you that because of this. There are people in this room who have withered hands. And it's probably most of you. <laughs> I, should have, I need to change that. It's probably most of us. You know what I mean? A place where you need healing. 
And so I, as I'm talking for the next few minutes, I can't promise where this is going to go. I just promise I'm going to finish on time. <laughs> So please just allow me to do this, because like, it's one thing I'm decent at, but sometimes I miss points, but I just hope that something I say you might grab onto and pay attention to. So I'm going to ask you to do, first of all, is do not discount yourself. Please do not discount yourself. Some of you who feel like misfits in this room, you haven't been able to fit in in college, you're trying to figure out what it is, you're in a fight with your parents, you know, some faculty who have been around here for a long time who are still trying to figure it out, you're about to know that I'm in a process of figuring it out. So don't discount yourself, please. I don't care what your story is. I'm up here on, like, speaking to you just because this is an honor to do this, but I can tell you my story is just as much wholeness and brokenness as any of you. So do not discount yourself when I ask you this question. Don't be afraid of this question. And you know you think this is on me, but I'm about to make it on you. So I'm going to ask you to answer this question in about two minutes, and I'm going to stop you, and some of you are going to be mad at me because you're going to want to talk more. Well, go talk more after chapel, please, okay? So here's the question. What would change if you were hearing God's voice more clearly? I know, some of, I, I saw that. Look, you're like, whoa, <laughs> we're going there? Like, <laughs> this is chapel, right? Don't discount yourself. I want you to approach this question. And if some of you say, listen to me, if some of you say, I don't know, I'd rather have you say it that way than go, I don't know. Move toward this question. It's messy. It's a mess for some of us. What would change if you were hearing God's voice more clearly? Right now, for you personally, I want you to take, I may give you 60 seconds, I may give you 120, we'll see how it goes. I want you to turn to the person next to you. I hate this part of church, by the way, like, say hi to somebody, and I'm like, oh, I hate this, and I'm always like, oh, it's probably a good thing, all right? So take a moment, answer that question, all right? Go ahead, take off. Interesting, huh? Interesting. I want to offer you this, this thing, just keep thinking about this, that so much of your development and growth as a person or as possibly a leader will be about questions like that. It won't be about the answers. It may be about the answers less of the time than it is about the questions. Maybe so. Okay, so let me give you a little context. I always think I kind of need to understand where someone came from. So first of all, uh, when Brian was talking about my past here, I am kind of, this is a, a crazy nostalgic moment. I just, I was weeping as I'm standing there. So my dad was the president here until 1968. We moved from here when I was five weeks old. So it's true that I was, <laughs> I started here, but I wasn't here long. And this is what is weird for me, and I hope you maybe think about your own story as I share this with you, but I would come back to Spring Arbor as a kid, and my grandparents' house was sitting about where the entry gate is, where, the, you know, the gate that's out on the highway? I don't know if my parents always call it the highway. I don't know, but the road out there, it's like, and there's a gate, there's these big, there's brick pillars now. I'm like, my parents, the little parsonage that my, my grandparents lived in was right there. I never heard my grandfather was the pastor of this church. His picture's downstairs. And I tell you this because I'm kind of flooded. It's news to you, but it's also kind of news to me because I never saw him preach. My memory of my grandfather in that little house was him cleaning his electric razor every day. Um, 
I moved from here, so my dad was the president of this university. Now, by the way, well, I'm not going to tell you that part of the story. I don't have time for that. But it's like I moved from here when I'm five weeks old. We go from Spring Arbor to Seattle. My dad becomes the president of Seattle Pacific University. So the first 14 years of my life, I'm now, I'm now I'm growing up in Seattle. So that's what I knew. So Spring Arbor was a, was a thing from where, from, it's where I came from. And then my dad, when I'm going into ninth grade, becomes the president of, of Asbury Theological Seminary that's in Wilmore, Kentucky. So now he goes to a seminary to be president, and that's where he retired from. So I spent four years in, back at a very, 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 very small town, tobacco farming community, and my dad's at a seminary. I tell you that because the, the interesting, the, the person that you're seeing today is someone I've always considered myself a bit of a mutt. And, and it's interesting. So this Carillon Tower is named after my folks, the McKenna Carillon Tower. My parents, let me tell you, they don't really care about names on buildings. It's not about that for them, but they are very symbolic. So think of the, 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 the experience that has forged who you see standing here. Is that the buildings that are, this, I've thought about this, the buildings that are named after my parents, who are amazing people, these are the buildings. The, the, the School of Business, the McKenna Hall, McKenna Hall at Seattle Pacific is named after my folks, a business school, all right? You go to Asbury, and there, it's the McKenna Chapel. It's a seminary. They train pastors, right? You go to India, there's another building that's called the McKenna College of Education and Leadership is named after my folks. And then you come to Spring Arbor, and there's this clock, <laughs> this giant clock. And I'm telling you, it's about the symbolism, because if you look at that clock, it's got, it's just, uh, have you been to the base of the clock? Symbolism matters. And I just, and I'm so, so if you think about who I am and who Brian described, I have never had a problem with this reality that life moves across these contexts. Does that make sense? Like, business, I'm telling you, what happens when you get out in the world is like, business people don't talk that well to academics, and academics and business people don't always talk that well to pastors. Okay, but the reality is if you talk to any one of them, you will hear all that. Because pastors, whether they like it or not, you know, they all go to seminary, but none of them complain after they finish or they go out into the world and become a pastor and they say like, I just wish I had learned more Greek. And I'm not slamming Greek because I'm very jealous that I never got to study Greek. What they, what they realize is like, I don't know how to fire somebody. Do you hear me? Yes, pastors have to fire people. You know, I don't know how to manage a budget. And money matters in a church. Do you know that this building doesn't stand here without resourcing? You don't get to go to school without resourcing. It's like all the structures of our life, it's a requirement. But business leaders, it's fascinating. Like Daniel and I sometimes feel like we're schizophrenic because it's like, we have to be careful of the language we lead. Because then we go into business, and business leaders will be like, uh, is this going to be personal? You know what I mean? It's like they're used to the money conversation, but to have a conversation on what they're called to is different. And so I'm just, I'm trying to set the tone for the reality. Because I, I read, let me read the Spring Arbor concept very quickly. Spring Arbor is a community of learners. And this is so crazy. Like my dad had a big hand in writing this bad boy. Okay, here we go. Spring Arbor is a community of learners. And I, I wrote, this is my parens if I had gotten my hands on it. <laughs> Risk takers, learners. Because they are a community of weirdos. Don't tell President Ellis I said this. All right, because they're a community of weirdos. Good thing he's off campus today. Continuing to edit, change, and figure out who, who they are. They need a ton of grace to remind themselves each day that they're going to need a lot of grace to get this right. That's my, that's my interpretation of community of learners, all right? Um, distinguished by a lifelong involvement. Full stop right there. Lifelong. This is a long haul for you. You're gonna, when you live long enough, you get to see things come back around, and you're someday going to be like, oh my gosh, my grandfather preached in this, on this property somewhere. You know, it's like it's a long haul play. And then it goes on to say, and I wrote, an awareness that what we do today may have long standing implications forever in the kingdom of God. And then it goes on to say, in the study and application of the liberal arts, I wrote, broadly educated in a specific discipline that each of you are studying, not just knowledge, but also practice. Those are my words. And then I wrote, total, and it says, it says total commitment to Jesus Christ as the perspective for learning. And I wrote in parens that our lens, that's our lens. And if you don't know what that means, 
go look at who Jesus was and is. And my dad, I talked to him just yesterday, and he told Daniel and me, he said, the most important word, I don't know if he said the most important, but the word, in that statement is this. It says total commitment to Jesus Christ as the perspective for learning. What my dad said is that we had a debate about this word because we did not say as a perspective for learning. You hear me? Like, that's the perspective. So then let's find out what the perspective is. And then it finishes. I'm sorry, I just, it's a great statement. And then it finishes with this. And critical participation in the contemporary world. And I might add, <laughs> if I was back there talking to my dad, I'd be like, put thoughtful in there. But it's like critical and thoughtful participation in the world. So let me tell you what participation in the world has meant for me. Can I tell you that? Like, these are some of the things like, what does it mean? Thank you. <laughs> is that you? Right on. Okay. What has that meant as I've gone out from a place like this? And I spent, as Brian said, like I spent, so <laughs> I spent 25 years as a professor and a business person. Never fully fit in either world perfectly with kind of a wannabe pastor inside of me. But you can see, like, that's what I was forged from. And so I want to just, as, as, I, as I've gone out, and this is the work that we do, so the organization that Daniel and I are a part of is called Wild Leaders, and, and it's more than a name, Wild. First of all, I love it that it has double meaning. First of all is this. Our faith in God and our story and our journey is a wild story. Just think about what got you sitting in this chair today. Pew. I'm sorry, these aren't chairs. These are pews, which is kind of awesome. You know what I mean? Can I see your faces? Like, do you know what I'm saying? Like, there's a weird story and a wild story that got you. There's a surprising way you landed sitting here today. That's one part of it. But the other thing that it stands for is whole intentional leader development. That's what it's about. And when I say whole, what do we mean when we say this word? Here's what I mean, all of it. Your whole story means all of it. Let that rest on you for just a minute. Your whole story, your journey toward wholeness, God wants all of it. And what I mean by that is that he not only wants, he sees all of it. It's why it's kind of overwhelming for me to imagine that God actually sees me whole. Come on, you know what I'm saying? Like, that creeps me out. Like, it's no wonder that people couldn't look in the eye of God. Like, I'm like, I think I would implode. Because who sees you whole? Who sees your brokenness as well as your redemption? Who sees the way you've let people down as, the way that you, as well as the way you've lifted people up? And what's fascinating is this. In our world, instead of whole approaches to developing people, so often we've picked fragmented approaches. And in the area of developing leaders, we see it a lot. For example, we tell you what you're, now don't hear me slamming any of these ways of approaching this question, like they're, they're not valuable, but they're pieces of the puzzle. For some of you, you assume that leadership development is understanding your personality. Is it important? Yes. Is it everything? No. For some of you, you think leadership development is understanding your strengths. It's not the whole story. You know that the whole story includes my brokenness, right? My screw-ups, my timidity, my reluctance, my courage, my competence, my skills, what I do every day. It includes all of those things. And it includes the call and purpose behind all that you do. Does that make sense? Like, it's just a different way of thinking about it. And what I'm inviting you into is the story like, of wholeness, of saying, like, what does it mean for me to intentionally develop who I am as a human being and a, as a leader or as a potential leader? The second word is the word intentional. The word intentional. I always think, you know, it's, it's interesting. A lot of times we kind of just say, like, well, the Lord's going to do what the Lord's going to do. The thing about the word intentional is that we have initiative in our own journey and anyone that tells me that, they, that we don't and just says, well, the Lord's going to do whatever the Lord's going to do, I'm like, you're not living in the real world. You have a brain. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have experiences. Think about this. 
I don't even know. Go, I hope you look at the, west, the, at the base of the, the uh, McKenna Carillon Tower is, is these four words. Do you, remember, do you know the four words? It's, it's called the Wesleyan Quadrilateral. It's these four ways, and it's basically what it is is John Wesley, in his theology, he never called it a quadrilateral as far as I know, but he used these words to describe the revelation of God in our lives. So think about this. Think about the words. Experience. Your experiences you're having right now are shaping the person you're going to be and also are where God is, is revealed. Like the experiences you're having, the failures, you fail a class. I'm a guy, I, I applied to 12, I'm, I'm out in something, I don't know if I've said this from a stage before. I applied to 12 PhD programs, guess how many I got into? One. <laughs> 11 failures and one success. You know, and I t- but it, did it teach me something? Of course it did. So experience matters in your understanding in, of the revelation of God. The second thing that's around that, that tower, if you look to another side of it, is tradition. Traditions matter. My parents were married in this church, not in this, this space, because this didn't exist. But did you know that when my parents were married here, you couldn't have instruments in church? You could have singers, but you couldn't have instruments. So all this, sinful. <laughs> you know, but, but traditions matter because they inform our understanding of God. Then, the, then there's another piece, reason. Go look at it. If you see this again, reason. What does that mean? This is why I love John Wesley. It means your brain matters. Do you hear me? Your studies matter. They are not evil. There are churches I could walk into where they're like, psychology is from the enemy. I'm like, the psychology is a revelation of God. You look at psychological literature and study of human beings, you know what it looks like? The gospel. (laughs) It really does. It's amazing. And you think about your studies and your disciplines, bringing your brain to that with intention like, what God opens up is unbelievable. I get so excited about, you're studying nursing, communication, psychology, sociology, ministry, you're going to go into theology. I don't know. All of engineering, it's amazing. The third word is leader. Leader. Whole, intentional leader development. What does this word mean? We played a game as children that was about this word. Yell it out. What was the name of the game? Follow the leader. In India, when I ask that, they say Simon Says. I don't know why. I think it's the same game. Did any of you show up at the local bushes or playground with your friends and go, I'll play this game you suggest. If we define what a leader is, you're eight years old, right? (laughs) What is the difference between a leader and a manager? Like, none of us ever did that, right? We show up, for some reason, we knew what the rules were. Can I have a nod or an amen? Like, do we know the rules? Right? We know the rules. And it made me, thank you, thank you from the back somewhere. By the way, did you know there's a correlation with where you sit in class and grade point average? So I was the guy, I always sat in back, but then when I heard this research, I just sat in front where all the straight-A students sat, and then they got really mad at me for doing that. So next time, sit in front and you get the A's. Um, Although I still sit back there sometimes, so you're good. But this this word leader, what is the fundamental rule for the leader? And the fundamental rule for the leader, as far as I can see, is is this. Listen to this. It's complicated, so write it down. The leader goes first. I didn't qualify it. The leader goes first. And when a leader goes first, things change. The first time that you step out and do something first, things will change. Whether you're the first person to listen, the first person to manage the group, the first person to be a supervisor, and when you do that, it will get hard. It will get difficult. I've seen it over and over again, and so that's why I've invested my life and career in the possibility that we could invest in a generation of courageous and sacrificial leaders. Philippians 2 kinds of leaders who would, who would mirror and reflect the glory of who Jesus Christ is 
Remember that Philippians 2? It says your attitude should be like that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, so his beloved God, and at the same time didn't it consider equality with God something, something to be grasped. And so as you go out and lead, some of you are in a leadership role right now. If it's hard, I know. But I spent my life, and that's what Daniel Halleck and I do, is trying to, to encourage these kinds of leaders, people that when it gets difficult, everybody's staring at you and you're failing and people, it's public and you're feeling isolated because the people you were friends before, now you're their supervisor or you're their resident advisor or whatever you call, we call them at Spring Arbor, that it gets tougher and it will get tougher. But we could be intentional about our development and preparation for that moment where we will go first. And those of you who are reluctant to lead to be leader disciples and heading out into the kingdom, I wanna, I wanna tell you that your reluctance does not scare me. I want some reluctant leaders. Do you know that there is talk? I don't know what's true anymore, right? But if you, if you just look around right now, there is the possibility that World War III is on our, on our horizon. Now, don't everybody freak out. Like, it's in the news. It's whatever Putin ends up doing, right? You know, it's like, or how we respond. But I tell you that, not because I want you to freak out about the world, but this. What if the next, what if the next president of the United States is sitting in this room, not the next one, but maybe 20 years from now, sitting in this room right now? What would it mean for us to begin to prepare that person for that possibility? And the person may be sitting here right now. And the last word in this whole thing, whole intentional leader development, is this, is development. And development is change, and change is hard. Right? If I ask any one of you to be someone different, you'll be like, that's a hard thing to do. So part of it's figuring out who you are, what your personality is like, what your skills are like, what your strengths are like, what is God saying specifically and uniquely to you, and at the same time, being willing to edit, being willing to say, I'm willing to change. Because that's what the development part, that's what the character part is difficult to do that. Whole intentional leader development. So I come back to my question I asked you at the beginning. Because I tell you that, that because one part of a whole person in leader's journey that is so critical and one of the starting points is this, this concept of calling. And some of you have heard this before. There's language we use around this word. The common language I hear all the time on Christian college campuses is, is this. What is my calling? You hear me? Have you said that before? What is my calling? And I say this because for the first time in history, as far as I can tell, we've never used this phrase before. The call on your life is not yours. It's not something you have. It's something you hear. It's not something you have. It's not something you are it's something you hear. Our only job, and I wish someone had told me this earlier, if that's true, like think about this. When God spoke to people in the Bible and called them, think about Moses. God said to Moses, I need you to go to Pharaoh and do this job. And Moses is like, I don't speak so good. And God's like, that's not what I said. I need you to go speak to Pharaoh. And the fact that you don't speak so good, that maybe your strength, because I need you to say this. It's, it's difficult, Moses, so write this down. Let my people go. I don't want an orator. I want you to say that. Do you hear me? And so I come back to my statement. Is, so we have complicated this and turned what is a, a, a summons on our life from the Lord into an identity where we feel this burden of, what, how do I find my calling? How do I discover it? Keep studying, and then I would just say, listen to God. Whatever your weird way of listening is. <laughs> and I, if, you look at, if you look at the base of McKenna Carolina Tower, Tower, there's some nice framework for it. Listen to your brain. Listen to your experience, what's happening around you, who's speaking in your life. Listen to the traditions, even the weird stuff about not having instruments or whatever. And first and foremost, get in Scripture. That's the foundation of it all. 
So I just want to leave you with this. I'm coming back to my question. I hope this echoes, for those of you that need this, this echoes for you all day today. Maybe as you go back and you look at the base of that clock. What did I ask you at the beginning? What would change? Uh, let, me, let me add something to the first part. What is God saying to you lately? To you. And if you don't know, I'm very interested, and I would say, tell me more about that. What is God saying to you lately? And what would change if you were hearing his voice more clearly? Because it begins there, and then we keep going. Let me pray, all right, as we finish. Lord Jesus, I am just so grateful to be here. I can't even believe I get a chance to speak to um, this community at Spring Arbor, and I just pray that you would wire us together, Lord. Bring more wisdom than I could even, whatever I said just now. And Lord, I just pray that you would help us to hear you more clearly today. You would invite our minds, invite our whole person into this story that you are unfolding that is for your glory. Bring our minds and our studies, our experiences, the traditions that surround us, and help us to be rooted in Scripture. And Lord, may your Holy Spirit just speak to us throughout today, this week, and for the rest of our lives. And I'm excited for whatever will come out of this moment. And I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Do you hear me? In that name. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.